What's going on wine lovers? I'm the wine astronaut and today we're going to explore the universe of Aussie Prosecco. Prosecco is a delicious and refreshing sparkling wine that is now more popular than champagne in terms of bottles sold. But for the past 12 years, Italy and Australia have been fighting a silent war over the name of this wine. Let me explain. In the world of wine, there's a few rules that everyone has to follow. If you want to call your Pinot Noir a Pinot Noir, it needs to be made from at least 85% Pinot Noir grapes. And if you want to call your sparkling wine a Champagne, then it needs to come from the Champagne region in France and be made in a certain way. And that's fair enough. If everyone called their bubbly wine Champagne and their Merlot a Pinot Noir because it contains a few Pinot Noir grapes, the world of wine would be even messier than it already is. So a few rules are not only necessary, but actually helpful to us as consumers. But what happens when someone decides they want to change the rules? Let's play out a little dream scenario. Imagine you wake up one day, quit your nine to five job and become a winemaker. You move to the country, plant some Prosecco grapes, and after years and years of backbreaking work and marketing, you've built a reputation for making high quality, delicious Prosecco, and you're finally able to make a living. And then some Italians knock on your door and say, look, I hate to be a pest, but we've actually changed the name of your grapes from Prosecco to Glera. So yeah, you can't call your wine Prosecco anymore. Oh, and now it's the name of a protected wine zone in Italy. So just like Champagne, you can only call it Prosecco if it's from this Prosecco region. But uh, best of luck selling your sparkling glera. I mean, you would be absolutely fuming. And I imagine that's exactly how the Aussie Prosecco producers felt in 2009 when this thing happened. Look, on the one hand, I understand Italy's desire to protect its creations. Barolo, Chianti, Brunello di Montalcino, they have and always will be Italian wines from Italian regions made according to Italian rules and traditions. So it's only fair that there are rules preventing others from using these names on a label. But the problem with Prosecco is that it was and still is in many places the name of a grape. It would be like Aussie winemakers changing the name of the Shiraz grape to Spiceball 3000, creating a region called Shiraz and then telling everyone else around the world that they can't put Shiraz on their label anymore because it's not from the new Shiraz winemaking region of Australia. And this is why, to this day, Aussie wine producers refuse to be bullied by the EU and continue to call their wines Prosecco. You see, without the word Prosecco on their bottles, their sales would take a huge hit because 99% of the population has no idea what a sparkling glera is. To be honest, I can't see them removing the word Prosecco from their labels anytime soon. But one thing's for sure, whether it's made in Italy or it's made in Australia, Prosecco's reputation for being one of the most approachable, refreshing and versatile wines out there is legit. And today we're going to taste an Aussie Prosecco called Sparkle Hard. But before we get into the tasting, this video is brought to you by winemasterclass.com. So if you want to learn how to taste and analyze wine like a pro, there's a free wine tasting crash course in the description. So once you finish watching this video, click the link in the description to enroll in our free wine tasting crash course. So back to the tasting. The wine we're going to be trying today is called Sparkle Hard, and it's a Prosecco from a local Victorian winery called Range Life Wine, which was actually a surprise because when I bought it, I had no idea that it was from the same winery as the Pet Nat that I featured in an earlier video. And I loved that Pet Nat, so I have high expectations for this one here. Now, the winery itself is located in King Valley, Victoria, which is where the first ever Aussie vineyards of Prosecco were grown in 1999. It's said that the cool climate of the King Valley closely resembles the climate of the Veneto region of Italy. So let's put that to the test. All right, so you know the drill. There are five steps to tasting a wine, pouring, looking, smelling, tasting, and reflecting. And to pour it, we gotta open it. Can I have a hand, please? There we go. <laughs> When you're drinking this one here, you wanna be drinking it cold, right? This has just come out of the fridge. The fridge is about four degrees and it's been sitting here for 20 minutes. So it's already probably getting a little bit warmer than you would like when you're first pouring it into the glass. There's nothing wrong with letting it sit in the glass and warming up a bit, but you want a Prosecco crispy cold. The glass as well, 
I really don't like any champagne flutes or anything like that, especially for sparkling. So I'm gonna use this one here. It's a small white wine glass, um, not particularly special, machine made. But if the wine's good, it won't matter. So let's pour it in. We're gonna pour 80 to 100 mils. Of course, when we're analyzing the appearance, we want our handy piece of A4 paper. You can use a tablecloth, whatever, tissue paper, it doesn't matter, as long as it's white. So you can look at it from here at a 45 degree angle. Now, first thing you wanna do is get your first impressions. And my first impressions are this thing is almost transparent, <laughs> definitely not opaque or hazy or anything like that. And there's clearly no sediment. So I would say the wine is clear and the color is a looks like a very pale straw with some golden in it. So pale straw slash gold. You can see the bubbles. They're not overwhelming, but they do look absolutely delicious. All right, so let's assess the smell or the nose of this Prosecco right here. Of course, the first thing you wanna do is check if it's in good condition. So you wanna stick your nose in and ask yourself two questions. Does it smell good and does the smell of the wine make you want to drink it? And for me, it's yes and yes. So this is in good condition. The next thing you want to do is think about the intensity. How intense are the aromas? Now, the Prosecco grape, the Glera grape, is actually semi-aromatic. And aromatic varietals are just grape varietals that are known for having really pronounced and easily identifiable aromas. So things like Riesling or Moscato. So Glera is semi-aromatic and from the smell, I can really pick that up. Although it's not, I wouldn't say it's pronounced, I would say it's medium plus. And the next thing we want to look for is the development of the aromas. These are, these are ripe, these are actually nicely ripe. So I'd say the, the, even though it's a young wine, I believe it's, it may not even have a vintage actually. Yeah, no vintage on this one. All right, so when you see a wine with no vintage, that essentially means that they've blended grapes that were harvested in different years. So this might have some 2019 grapes in it, some 2020 grapes in it. Um, that's essentially what a non-vintage wine is. So it's not grapes that were picked in a specific year, it's grapes that were picked in any number of years. So I don't actually know how old this is, but I would assume that it's a blend uh, that has some older grapes in it because the, actual, the aromas are um, quite developed and quite enjoyable. So speaking of enjoyable aromas, what we want to think about is which aromas, which specific aromas can we get from the wine? There's definitely some green apple. Um, I'm not even picking up the citrus just yet, but there's green apple. We've got some green pear. The citrus is not like um, lemon or lime citrus. It's more like a grapefruit citrus, which is really enjoyable. There's also a little bit of elderflower. Um, I had an elderflower gin tonic recently and that was delicious and I'm getting a little bit of that, uh, a little bit of that elderflower uh, aroma on the nose. So that's quite enjoyable. And there's a little bit of honey, just a little bit. So it smells a little bit sweet. Proseccos are typically bone dry. So be interested to see what this tastes like. Speaking of tasting, let's get on to that. All right, so now it's everybody's favorite part, <laughs> drinking the actual wine or tasting it rather. Tasting it means you're paying attention. Drinking it means you're not paying any attention. So let's taste it. First thing we're looking for is sweetness. It's not as bone dry as some Proseccos you can get. Um, I would say there is a little bit of residual sugar. Um, it feels a little bit fuller bodied, which we'll get to that in a minute, but that's telling me that there may be some, a, a slight amount of residual sugar in this one. Now, typically Proseccos are known for their acidity as well, their palate cleansing acidity, great for aperitivo, stuff like that. So let's analyze the acidity. You know, surprisingly enough, this actually is not that acidic. If it is, it's very, very well balanced into the wine. I'm not getting any um, incredibly mouthwatering uh, sensations. It's, uh, Prosecco is also known for stimulating the appetite. This is why everybody has it before a meal because it stimulates your saliva glands, which makes you hungry. And uh, that's why it's great before a meal. But this one has actually has really nicely balanced acidity. I know my girlfriend Natalia would like this because she, she can't deal with the wines that are too acidic. So 
uh, nah, you would enjoy this. Next thing we want to look at is the tannins and for this there are no tannins. So alcohol here is, um, I would say, medium low. It's very mild, not really noticeable. It's not as airy and sparkly as you would expect. I know it says sparkle hard, but if you look at it, it almost looks like a still wine right now. You know, I've probably swirled all the bubbles out. I can't stop swirling. It's not super light body. It's actually a little bit fuller bodied. So that's, that's what makes me assume that there's a little bit of residual sugar in this one. So when it comes to intensity, you wanna just see how intense are the flavors uh, that you're picking up when you take a sip. So let's do that now. And I wouldn't say they're as intense as the nose. The nose is getting up there almost to be quite pronounced. I would say this is medium. And the next thing you wanna do is think about, do the flavors that you're tasting match what you were smelling? So does the palate confirm the nose? And for me, it does. But there's one thing that sticks out a little bit more than on the nose, even though it's less intense, and that's the green apple. I'm just getting so much Granny Smith uh, green apple flavor, a little bit of the green pear here. Um, but what I've found is that there's nothing new on the palate um, that I'm discovering, that I didn't already discover on the nose. The next thing we wanna think about is the balance. Now, for me, it's actually very well balanced. The acidity is on point, the alcohol is relatively low, it's unnoticeable, the flavors aren't you know, punching you in the face, the aromas are nice, the sweetness, it's a little bit sweeter than I'm used to from a Prosecco, but it's not over the top, you know? It's, uh, in fact, I think that the, probably the, the residual sugar is helping to round everything out because it does feel quite round and a little bit uh, fuller bodied than a typical Prosecco would. So I would say this is actually very well balanced. Um, its length is not very long. It kind of disappears from the palate uh, after you take a sip, but Proseccos aren't known for their lingering flavors. You know, Prosecco, a good Prosecco is refreshing, it's light, it's delicious, but it's not gonna stick around for too long. And this one I would say is medium minus in terms of the length or yeah, around that. And then complexity, it's not a very complex wine. It doesn't need to be, it's not trying to be, it's refreshing, it is what it is. And you know, besides the little bit of sugar, it's relatively similar to all the Italian Proseccos that I've tried, and I've tried a lot. All right, so we've poured, looked, smelt, tasted, and now it's time to reflect. And when we're reflecting on the wine, I like to give it a personal score, because then I know if I want to drink it again, and I know where it stands for me personally. So I've built a scoring criteria, and there are five parts to this scoring criteria. The nose, the palate, the value for money, the desire to revisit, so how likely is it that you'll buy this wine again, and the recommendation likelihood. If someone asks me for a Prosecco, how likely am I to recommend this Prosecco? Now, for the nose, very enjoyable. I'd give it a four. It's, um, it's aromatic, you get the citrus, you get the green fruits, the apples, the pears. The palate, it's very well balanced. I would like a little bit more flavor intensity um, and a little bit more length, but the palette is, is nice. I'm not gonna give it a five or a four, but I'll give it a three. The value for money is fantastic. That's a four for this. It's $23. It's a local Victorian uh, Aussie winery. So that's a four out of five. Desire to revisit, I would say it's a three. I'm not particularly inspired to revisit this Prosecco. Maybe that's because I just wanna try some other Aussie Proseccos. And recommendation likelihood, if someone asks for an Aussie Prosecco, the fact that I've tasted it uh, and I know it's good already, um, I would recommend it. So I would say this is a four out of five for the recommendation. But um, yeah, if we add that up, I believe that's what, 3.6? Yeah, <laughs> 3.6. So. If we're going by just the scores alone, I actually preferred the Pet Nat, um, but that doesn't mean this isn't a good wine. It's still very, very enjoyable. It's, I think it's a good example of an Aussie Prosecco, and I'm not disappointed. In fact, the fact that it was only $23 um, is fantastic. You're getting a lot of wine for $23. So yeah, not a bad score. I hope that's the right score, 3.6. I don't have a calculator, so I don't know. <laughs> 
All right, so what are some takeaways from this Prosecco tasting? Well, number one, I would drink them cold. You wanna take it right out of the fridge and into the glass as soon as you can. If you can't, even an ice bucket would be fantastic, but the idea with Prosecco is drink it cold, drink it crispy, it's meant to be refreshing. It's also meant to be appetizing, stimulating your appetite with a bit of acidity. So with Prosecco, if it has a vintage, go for a younger one. You don't need an aged Prosecco, they're not designed to be aged. So go for something young, if it doesn't have a vintage like this one, it's not a big deal, but yeah, don't be afraid to buy young when it comes to Prosecco. What occasion would I drink a Prosecco in? Almost any occasion. Um, celebrations are meant for Prosecco. If you are, for example, if there's an occasion where you could have an Aperol Spritz, you could drink a Prosecco by itself. Speaking of Aperol Spritz, this would be perfect in an Aperol Spritz. You're getting that delicious uh, green apple flavor. It's quite fresh. The next thing is what sort of food would I pair it with? And for me, Prosecco is like an aperitivo. So I'm thinking like a cheese board, a charcuterie board, um, some cured meats like prosciutto, something like that. You know, you want little snacks, maybe some bread and crackers. That's really what Prosecco is made for. It's, it's, it's refreshing, it's celebratory. So I think that would be perfect. So is Aussie Prosecco really Prosecco? Well, the Northern Italians would say no, and the Aussies of King Valley would say yes. In fact, Range Life Wine even went to the effort of explaining what they believe Prosecco is on the back of the bottle, stating clearly that Prosecco is simply a sparkling wine made from Prosecco grapes. For me, it is, and it isn't. It's undeniably a Prosecco. It's made the same way, it has the same grapes, it's got the same bubbles. The climate is almost identical to the region in Italy that is called Prosecco, but geographically, it's obviously not the original Prosecco. And to be honest, I don't think it needs to be. It's certainly not a lesser wine. In fact, most local Aussie Proseccos are better value for money than their Italian namesakes. And I have a feeling that the Aussies won't be changing the name of their delicious sparkling wines anytime soon. But I'm interested to hear your thoughts. So leave a comment down below. Do you think Aussie Prosecco is real Prosecco? Do you think they have a right to call it Prosecco? Let me know. And that wraps up the video guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more, then hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications so we can explore the universe of wine together. Cheers.